about the energy. Wow. Wow, right? Wow. So y'all got some energy today, huh? We're going to have a good time. That's what we need. This is my vibe right here. I'm going to pop these yeah. on. Thank you. You going to pop them on? You going to get cozy? Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Oh, my goodness. Well, what's up, y'all? Um, I'm your host, Beamer the Storyteller, and of course, we're here today with none other than JoJo. Um, and it's, yes. yes, please make some noise. Thank you, thanks for um, having me. JoJo, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, about artists and just thinking about how your careers can go so many different ways, right? Just ways we can never imagine yeah. from where it starts. Um, you know, there are days where you, you start out, you sign with a major and things could go you know, blow up exponentially. And then there are times where who knows what happened? Curveballs happen. That's um, life. And that's life, yeah. right? But the ones that are resilient figure out what's really meant for them. So today we're here on Bars and Nuggets, a podcast by Amazon Music, where we get to dive deep into your story. We get to dive deep into the moments that have been iconic to you. And so I'm excited that we get to be here in your living room with these People. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. Doesn't it feel a little cozy? Spacious, yes. Lighting, great lighting. <laughs> now, tell me, what's been going on? I saw you had performed with Kehlani recently. Like, that yes. looked super fun. That was fun. Yeah. I, she, We've known each other for a, a long time, mostly through the internet, and then yeah. through seeing each other out and stuff, mutual friends. And she hit me up. I was just leaving Trader Joe's, and she was like, girl, will you please come sing my favorite song? I'm like, what is your favorite song? And then she sends me a voice note. She's like, get up, get up. And I'm like, I'm like, what time is your show? She's like, nine. I'm like, babe, it's six. <laughs> oh, a lot so, of notice. So I was like, you know what? If I can make this work, I'm going to make it work. So it was really fun. I That's ran really into a lot of- you pulled up. I'm glad I got to do it. It was, it was a good time. Yeah, I saw the video. The energy looked like really, really great. It looked like you were really happy to be there. I mean, I, I'm always happy to get a chance to perform and hmm. I always get really nervous, but I'm in a season of saying yes to things, hmm. even if it's inconvenient, even if hmm. it's not the way I thought it, like, yes, why not? Like if I can, <laughs> if I can make it to Inglewood in two hours and do my hair and makeup and figure out what to wear, yes. Yes, you're doing it. I like that. I'm in the season of yes, because yeah. you never know what can happen. That's right. Um, stay open to the possibilities. Stay open to it. Now, you've been singing for a minute, right? And so I want you to take us back a little bit to, to those origins and, and towards the beginning. And so I know you were raised in Foxborough, just outside of Boston, right? Um, and you were living with your mom. What was that that day-to-day -day like for you as a kid? Day-to-day -day was like filled with music. Hmm. So I was attending the local public school yeah. in Foxborough, hmm. elementary school, but I was bullied a lot actually. Hmm. So I never really felt like I fit in. I wasn't cool. I was hmm. actually quite weird as I was told. And hmm. like looking back, definitely confirmed. <laughs> I, was, I was a weird little kid. <laughs> But um, I was very curious and um, I really enjoyed learning, but just kind of, I was comforted by music and mm. being an only child, I spent a lot of time by myself yeah. and with adults. So I think that that kind of influenced my personality a bit. Which yeah, was, you're probably like, I can't really resonate with these kids. I'm more so used to hanging around older people. I guess, people. I guess. But yeah, day-to-day -day life was just school, yeah. singing, and then, <laughs> Whenever my I could convince my mom to take me into the city, into Boston or Providence, and like put a hat out on the street and sing. Now, a lot of people are, are familiar with the idea of a stage parent. That wasn't necessarily my mom. She had mm. her own quirks, but she wasn't making me sing. She wasn't like, I'd be like go sing. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, Ma, we gotta go to the city so I can make you know money for yeah. myself. Yeah. Like <laughs> It's just extra on the side stuff. <laughs> wow. So you were like just running around here singing, having just a Just running morning, around right? singing. What was, um, what was the financial aspect of, of your life at that point? Did you notice anything different about how you were being raised uh, versus, you know, what was so, maybe the kids you went to school with? Yeah. So Foxborough is a middle class town south of Boston. Mm -hmm. And we were not quite middle class. Like mm -hmm. it was just my mom and I. My dad lived in New Hampshire. And um, and so it was really my mom supporting me financially and she was cleaning houses for a living. And she was also a soprano soloist at our local Catholic church. Huh. So that doesn't, you could imagine we weren't rolling in money. Yeah. Um, so we shared a bedroom and it was, I definitely remembered feeling when I would go to my friend's houses being like, 
I still feel that way sometimes. When mm. I walk into big places and stuff, yeah. I still get that sense of being, it back to, being to a childhood. poor little girl. Yeah. yeah. Not I mean, I we never I never went hungry. Mm-hmm. So my mom did an amazing job with what she what she had. Single mom's strength, you know what I mean? Like Unparalleled. some of the strongest people on earth. <laughs> Definitely. I hope to never have to do that because that is freaking crazy. It's crazy. Um, um, sorry, these shoes are too cute not to wear them. <laughs> With the quick switch up. <laughs> so tell me about this, going back to your childhood, right? And you're talking about how it was, it was different and it was unique and you kind of felt like a, a bit of a, on your own path. And I think a lot of that had to do with you being a really talented singer at a very young age. Did you have ambition of doing something with that? Oh my God, I knew. Like I, as soon as I saw, I don't remember the first time I saw Whitney Houston or Mariah huh. Carey on an award show, but I like the Divas Live of it all. I you know, remember VH1, Divas. Yeah, Divas Live. I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to be right up there with Chaka Khan yeah. and the other Divas. And um, so I, I was super clear that that's what I hmm. wanted to do. I had other interests. I loved animals. Yeah. I loved, I was just a ham, as they said. Like I loved acting and singing and gathering people and, mm-hmm. and bringing people together. That was something I really loved. So I was always really clear that I wanted to do it professionally. Wow. What did your mom think about that? I think my mom was just terrified. My mom was just terrified of life in general. Like, mm-hmm. so, you know, her, her childhood, her circumstances, you know, gave her that worldview. So I think that having this child who was so laser focused mm. on something, she was like, what am I supposed to do with this little yeah. thing? <laughs> so she, she did her best. And uh, I think she just wanted to protect me from what the she world. read about right. in everything you need to know about the music business. Hmm. You know, because yes, from the world and particularly from an industry where like a lot of wild shit happens. So take me to, you went and performed on America's Most Talented Kids. Yeah, so when, right. I, when we were 11, I somehow convinced my mom, because there was nothing really tethering us to Massachusetts anymore. Uh, she, had been, she was out of a relationship mm-hmm. and I was being bullied so badly that I would like live in the guidance counselor's office. Oh wow. I was always there. I would pretend to be sick and I'd gotten quite good at it, at least I thought, maybe they could see through it. But <laughs> I was just telling the, like, I was like, Ma, can we please move to California? I know you have a cousin out there. Oh, you were <laughs> I trying had a to plan. get out. Yeah, you were trying literally to move it forward. like, <laughs> where are you getting these ideas from? <laughs> I don't know, TV? <laughs> I don't know, like Nickelodeon shows or something? <laughs> and so we, we moved to California, and that's when um, it, we moved to a place called La Habra. Mm-hmm. And then we would, we, I don't know, if she shipped our Echo. She had a Toyota Echo, <laughs> shipped it to L.A., and we would drive that all around to auditions. One of them was America's Most Talented Kids. Mm. Lost. You lost. Thought my life was over. But, but what it was happened just was beginning. the visi- vis- visibility of it, right? Like it was, it's the things you don't think about, right? Yeah. Like sometimes a loss isn't a loss, it's a It was someone in the audience who mm. then introduced me to a lot of, uh, who introduced me to Vincent Herbert, mm. who later became my executive producer of my first album. Right. So right. that was one of those sliding door moments that if I had just left, in a huff after losing to a oh, violinist. All mad, all sad, don't want to talk to anyone yeah. losing to a violinist. Yeah, <laughs> and then I you know, might not be here with you right now. Right. Okay, so you sign with the major, you sign this deal. What are you thinking at the time? What are you and your family thinking at I'm the thinking, time? I'm thinking, this is it! And that was, but it was <laughs> it. And it was it. Yeah, like, that's it. I had already, so I was 12 years old yeah. when, I, when I signed that deal. And it was just like, it felt right on target for me mm. though. So I wasn't like, it felt to me like I had been singing my whole life, which I had at that point. And like, mm-hmm, this is the right order of operations. I'm getting signed, I'm working <laughs> on my album. The label moved us from LA to New Jersey. Okay. I had my own Wait, room. Wait, why did they the move first you back I think, across? I think for like child labor law stuff. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> they just did move us there. Um, and because their headquarters, I think, were in New York and yeah. a bunch of different convenient Logistic reasons. Logistic stuff made sense to be yeah. close. Yeah. So I had my own room, hmm. had like a cool, we had a cool apartment in New Jersey, and it was so exciting. Wow. Still enrolled at public school at the time. Um, was that weird to be like, no, you're assigned to a label, you're working on this big album? It made know, me feel really single. cool and important. <laughs> And uh, gave me a sense of 
security because I think I felt so insecure with other yeah. kids at school because I just felt so. I think that the bullying really like just it made me, you. yeah, made you me were feel insecure. Thinking about like what you did and like how yeah, people would perceive it. Exactly. So I was like hoping that people would think that I wasn't just the annoying girl who would sing all the time and that I was actually doing it because something cool is going to happen, maybe. Did people know that you were working on, like, did some of the kids in school or teachers know you yeah, were? Yeah, some of the kids did. Hmm. Actually, I think all of them did. Because I, sure, I told, I was really excited. <laughs> I was hyped. Um, but I actually met one of my best friends, who's still one of my best friends now, who comes from, like, a musical family lineage. Like, his dad mm. is Gerald LeVert, and his oh, granddad wow. is uh, Eddie LeVert from the OJs. Yeah. So uh, he's still my, my bestie. And to have somebody who, like, grew up in that, that made me feel seen as well. Right. It made, and it made you feel Taught a little more comfortable. Even. Yeah, yeah it made taught me feel you a lot, right? And you could share that back, you know, with your team and yeah. say, like, hey, this is what they said we should look out for. Right. So 2004 happens, right? This is a big, 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 big year for you, right? Like, this is what you've been looking forward to. Lead, get out, it drops, it releases. Number one, you're the youngest artist in history to do that. Woo! Yeah. I mean, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Y'all did it. I mean, if you listen to the song, then you guys did it because I wouldn't have even known that it would ever be that successful. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't consider myself a pop girl necessarily. Mm -hmm. I thought I would. What know, did you I consider? I considered myself a soul singer. Mm. Um, so I didn't even love the song when it when I first cut it. So I'm I'm grateful to to Black Round and to to Vincent mm. for choosing that song because that gave me a career. Wow. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, everybody knows that song. I know that song. I love that song. Right. I, I like it now too. <laughs> <laughs> so it grew funny. on me. <laughs> so this is happening. Things are changing, obviously, for you. Um, your visibility, your popularity. Um, how are you feeling inside about those changes? Um, I mean, I love it. It's so yeah. cool. I have peop I have a stylist and I have somebody <laughs> like making these cool custom outfits with like Celtics jerseys. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, wow. Like it's a little girl's dream in a lot yeah. of different ways. I loved performing. I loved my team, all of that. But it was also very much a whirlwind. I don't even mm. think I was really aware that the song went number one. There wasn't... Um, like I didn't, I don't know. It, it was a whirlwind Yeah. because I was also doing school full time. Hmm. So I had a tutor on the road with mm -hmm. me. Um, so I don't know that I was like really like present what in a like moment. what's happening yeah. in your life. You're kind of like, there's so much going on. Yeah. I'm like, I'm doing a bunch of different things. But I didn't things. feel overwhelmed by it. Ah. I loved it. Yeah, you loved it. Yeah, I felt like I was, I was born to do that. Wow. So take me into 2006. You know, your career is continuing to go. You've been on the road. You're, you got a tutor. You're still trying to balance, you know, normal life things. Uh, too Little, Too Late comes out. It's number three. So, yeah. I mean, it's safe to say your career is, you're there, right? Like in, in your eyes, maybe from what you envisioned as a child, it seems like. That's what I envisioned, yeah. That's what you envisioned, right? Yeah. Like you, you close to being divas on stage at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, did you ever have, um, at that point in time, did you ever wish that you had some more normal aspects to life? Did you ever want to just be a normal teenager? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I did not. In retrospect, only in retrospect can I see that maybe my personal development, you know, mm. could have been stronger had I had some more normal aspects. Yeah. Because I had, I had my best female friend that I met uh, on the playground when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. I had LaMica, my best guy friend. So I had, you know, people that were not in the music industry that I felt were helping to keep me grounded. Mm -hmm. My mom would always be like, you're getting too excited about yourself. <laughs> I don't mean literally sad <laughs> across the face, but like chill out a little bit. Yeah, she's like, hey. Yeah. Be, and yeah. my whole family, you know, just coming from Massachusetts, I was, I felt pretty grounded. But yeah, it was, I loved it. I didn't want to be normal. I mm. liked walking, like I liked shutting them all down. <laughs> and I, I, because I think- Shutting them all down, you say it so casually. <laughs> I know, but that, that meant something to me when I was 15. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I can't go to the mall. I'm really famous. <laughs> I just think that it felt like validation for all the people that bullied me. Yeah. I, I think now, now that I'm really letting it sink in, I was so hurt mm -hmm. as, as a child by, by the kids who were, who were mean right. that when I knew that they were trying to um, like sneak into my birthday party mm. in Boston mm. or something, I'm like, no, don't let them in. And I loved that. 
So it felt I mean, like vindication. Who could, who could blame you, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to experience that so young. And then all of a sudden, things flip sides, and you know the only reason that folks want to show People up is because so you're fake. popular. Yeah, yeah, I hate that. <laughs> so take me to, to to JoJo post, you know, kind of those teen years, high school years. You're you're 18. Yeah. You're you're working on maybe your third project at this time, and you end up moving into Boston, right? You yeah. in South Boston. Yeah. Yeah. What? So young adult JoJo. What's young adult JoJo like? Young adult JoJo just wants to work. Yeah. I was so excited to turn 18 because I had, was so over the child labor laws, even for myself. <laughs> I wanted to work. I'm like, let's work 25 hours in a yeah. day. I wanted to be able to do all the things that I saw my mm. peers doing. But since I was always the youngest ever, I'm like, okay, now I'm not the youngest. Now I'm 18. What were some of those differences that you observed that they were able to do that well, you weren't? Well, it was, it was, you know, my, my mom was protecting me huh. from being overworked. Gotcha. So when I turned 18, I was like, I'm gonna see you go. later. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I got my own crib and then uh, lived in Boston from 18 to 19. Mm -hmm. At 19, I had fully made the decision that I wasn't gonna go to college right away. Okay. I had committed for sociology and I was gonna go to Northeastern, actually. Didn't end up going, but um, moved to LA because I wanted to make things work with uh, the record label. Mm -hmm. They were no longer technically a functioning label. What do you mean by that? I mean that they no longer had a distribution deal. So they didn't have the means to put out my music as it stated in the contract that mm. I signed. How would you learn that? Through coming through the contract. Okay. Um, and there, there just started to be some, some issues. After, after my executive producer left, um, left to go work on some other things. Some other things, yeah. And left to go work with Lady Gaga and start other oh, wow. careers and do amazing things, mm -hmm. but I think he wanted to part ways with the label that I was signed to. Right. And so I was like, okay, what, what, what can I do? Because there's, they can't put out my music, mm -hmm. but they won't let me go. Hmm. Maybe I should just be closer to them so I can just see, see, see what they need. Yeah, or maybe like, maybe I can, can be helpful, work. we can collaborate. Yeah, because... You know, clearly there's nothing malicious happening here. Like, I, no. I want to I make really, it work. yeah. I don't like ending things. I don't, I don't enjoy that process. Mm. I don't like conflict. Mm. So um, just wanted to be in L.A. so I could be working with the producers and the co-writers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and during that young adult time from, like, 18 to 21, I was, I mean, I recorded hundreds of songs. I would even cut demos just to sing. Like, if somebody <laughs> else, if they were like, I want to shop this record to, you know, insert Any person, yeah. I would be like, I, I want to sing today. I'll just do it. I loved being in the studio. You couldn't get me out of the studio. Mm. And it, that was a really fun time. I mean, uh, Priscilla Renee, who goes by Money Long yeah. now yeah. and who's having an incredible right. success. Yeah. We were kind of in similar circles similar a lot, pockets. popping in and out of studios <laughs> and working and doing different things, honing our yeah. ourselves. And so I was really working mm -hmm. during the day and then partying at night. It was my college <laughs> so time. So you were just both ends of the spectrum. Both you ends were just of the spectrum. Going. And I was just making out with strangers. <laughs> I can't believe that nobody caught me like falling out of a club oh or falling God. onto somebody or you, doing you weren't something. You were popping up on TMZ. Yeah, I mean, it's literally only by the grace of God. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it other than that. So this is happening, right? So you're, 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 you're partying, but you're also recording. Um, at what point do you get frustrated with what's happening about the music not coming out? Because I have to imagine between that second album and this time, there's a lot that's changed with you as an artist. There's a lot that's changed with you as a person. And I imagine you probably want to share that with your fans, right? That's why you're recording demos. That's why you're showing up to the studio. Um, how are you starting to shift? I don't even know if I was really cognizant of how I was shifting mm -hmm. because I was, um, I think that's when I learned how to kind of put, well, no, I mean, I was numbing myself with alcohol is mm -hmm. really what I was doing because I was so terrified, so embarrassed of, the, of how long it had been since mm. I had released music. Uh, people were asking questions and I didn't have concrete answers for them because I was delivering tons of music yeah. to my label. 
I was cutting what they wanted me to cut. I was cutting what I wanted to cut. I was saying, I'll release what you want me to, mm -hmm. to release. I just wanted to move forward and to not be able to made me feel so embarrassed and so out of control. Wow. So how would you start to think about brainstorming solutions, right? Because you're like, no, I have to figure out a way because I'm not giving up this thing that I'm uniquely great at and that's unique for me. Like, you, you, you know, you love to sing. Yeah, right? music is my life, always Your has life. been. So I, I was inspired by what people in hip hop have been doing mm. forever, mm -hmm. which is making mixtapes. Mm. I Whether love it's, a mixtape. Me too. <laughs> selling them out of the back of a car or selling them in a barbershop or, you know, selling them on Venice Boulevard or like, you know, <laughs> wherever, wherever. Wherever. So people would like take tracks that existed on other artists and write their new stuff over yeah. it. And um, I don't know what came first, me doing a full mixtape or me doing my Marvin's Room cover. The, the Marvin's Room cover, Drake right? Song. Like that was the, the Drake song. That was 2011. Yeah, so I was 20. Yeah. So that's, um, I think around that same time, I started asking the producers that I had been working with for my third album, mm. telling, letting them in on my, the situation I was going through. Mm. That So that this whole time, they didn't really know the details of that. Like you're holding, nah, I mean, no, they I'm, I'm knew, lying. They knew. They knew some they stuff. They knew. I'm yeah. sure I was crying, hyperventilating, having a panic attack in the studio um, about what I was going through with my family and what mm. I was going through with my label. Yeah. I was just so distraught at that time in my life. Mm. But I stayed busy. That was what gave me something. Yeah, it gave you to. some comfort because you weren't always just like in yeah. the stress of it. Right. Yeah. So being in the studio was that. And so I asked them, is there a way that we could just put this out on the internet, that we could work on some songs? Mm. And, and by asking to just put it out on the internet, that meant that they would have to forego payment. That meant that they would miss out on how producers and songwriters and all that get paid. Um, because I wouldn't be making money from it either. Either, right. But that was a loophole. Uh, so that you could still, so I could still release music and still let folks know that Joe Joe's still that I'm here. alive, yeah. Yeah, because there had been a long time since we exactly. had heard from you. Exactly, so hmm. I started putting together my first mixtape called mm -hmm. Can't Take That Away From mm -hmm. Me, which mm -hmm. even, <laughs> thank you. Which, even the title was just like a fuck you to, <laughs> to anybody who I felt, or even just a unnamed, you know. Anyone who was against enemy. what you were trying to do. Yeah, I was like, you know what? My relationship with my fans is, is between us. It's between us, not a middleman. You can't take my voice away from me, even if you legally own it. Mm. You, know, I, you know, you just can't take this, what has been created, away from me. So I really wanted to move forward with that. And that, I think that that, the reception from my fans of releasing that kept me alive, gave me purpose, mm -hmm. and, and really made me feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna give up. It kind of sounds oh like God. that was a moment that, that took you back into like really reaffirming, like, no, Jojo, you're meant to sing. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, but take me to, how did you convince all of these folks that are used to getting paid and the hours that you're gonna work in a studio, because you already said you like to work. I do. So I'm imagining you're like, I'm not leaving till it's finished. Period. <laughs> <laughs> How are you convincing these folks to, to do it for free? It actually, it makes me emotional to think about how they, it didn't take much convincing. Hmm. They, they believed in me. And that is what it's all about, period. Mm -hmm. um, because that, that emotional investment and that investment of time, you can't get that back. <laughs> it just made me so, so grateful. These people at the top of their game were, were willing to rock with me. <laughs> so, you know, and then I'm sure there was negotiation on the backside with like making <laughs> sure that things were taken care of as far as, I don't know, things that are above things, my head. Things, yeah, but, just the, some of those yeah, little details. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, I'd be paying for a studio and things like that, but mm -hmm. as far as, the, uh, the way it normally goes with an official release, this was different. This was different. This was different. And so you were involved, you had to be involved in different aspects of that release that you'd probably never touched before and never been able to touch before just right. because of the label's involvement. Yeah. Um, what were some of those things that you were excited to actually get your hands on? Like, I hired the photographer, <laughs> I styled myself, I, I don't remember if I did my make own makeup or if Carlene did my makeup actually for that, <laughs> for the mixtape cover. Um, but I, you know, 
I put the project together. Yeah. So it was really the first time that I got to be at the helm of all things creative for it. Mm -hmm. And even where, like, even for Marvin's Room, we decided to give it to wrap up because that was, and that's a website. I, I yeah, that's a website know. at the yeah. time, right? Where mm -hmm. a lot of new music was coming out. It was a, it was a destination Absolutely. for emerging and, and, and new music. Yeah, so my relationship yeah. with them was really integral in like yes. spreading the word and having that be a place where people could go and, and listen to it and all that. What was the, so you're, you're thinking behind that, behind putting it there versus maybe some other channel of your own. Why did you want to go that route? Why well, was it important? We, I just gave them the like, the first interview about it. I just trusted them yeah. and they were just, I just thought they would get it, especially mm -hmm. this whole spirit of putting a mixtape together yeah. and making a making lemonade out of lemons, I guess. <laughs> um, Truly. <laughs> and but I think I put it on Bandcamp mm -hmm. and SoundCloud, mm -hmm. but definitely Bandcamp. Um, so yeah, I didn't really care where it went. I was just like, what's I the- I just wanna put it out. Just wanna put it out. But I really enjoyed the process of like, I want these images to represent mm. this project. Um, at 12 years old, of course, I had no idea what was gonna be right for no, me or, or who I yeah. was as an artist. Yeah, you're still figuring but a lot out. But by that time, I had a clear sense of like what mm. I liked. What were you hoping to represent during that time? How fucked up I was. <laughs> so this was, it was getting jet black hair. I was like, you know, uh, combat boots, ready to go to war. Like, woo! I was just like, I'm a tough bitch and I want to show you. Because yeah. I just felt like, I was like, I can drink you under the table and yeah. still sing like a bird. That's that, that's that's what that I wanted New to England represent. in you coming yeah. out. It was very New England. It was yeah. very Irish pub girl. Yeah. <laughs> Irish pub girl era. <laughs> so we're just going to take shots with you, right? We're going to take right. shots with JoJo. <laughs> uh, I hate shots, but I, I will do a whiskey on ice. <laughs> Dope. So uh, did you have any nervousness before that project was coming out? Because I, I just have to think that when, at the place that you're at going into that, it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, and, and I know you, you were working with Wrap Up and there was additional support and energy, but... What's going on before you know other people know it's out? Um, probably just like perusing social media, <laughs> meaning like mostly Twitter. That was yes. the big one at the time. Okay. So engaging with people on Twitter, making things on YouTube, um, seeing what people were talking about, feeling like there was an interest, hmm. at least in my fans, for more music. Yeah. That, that's what made me even want to put something out because of the relationship that I have with them yeah. and uh, through social media. Yeah. And, but I was so scared, mm -hmm. so scared, especially to do something without Vincent, mm -hmm. uh, who was my executive was producer, producer through the first two albums. And I knew that these songs weren't, I didn't expect for them to be uh, global smashes because I also know that that actually takes money. Hmm. Maybe, to, to market them and yeah, put them in Yeah, maybe contrary to popular belief, <laughs> Like even the things that look like they're homegrown, they're really not. Hmm. There's, I, for the most part, there's money behind that push to get records out there. So I just knew that I had to really like these songs and believe that I know my fans and that we would, we, we've grown up together. Right. So maybe if, you're, if I'm going through this at 20, maybe you are maybe too. Maybe you are too. Yeah. Wow. But I was so scared. Wow. Because you have imposter syndrome, you have yeah. like, um, and, I, and I just, I felt supported and I simultaneously felt alone. So it releases and what happens? Like, how do people respond? It releases and I literally thought that I was seeing the wrong numbers because- <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> no, because so many people were listening to it. I think it was like 700,000 downloads in like the first week. That sounds wrong. That sounds like That's a number I could have never imagined. Yeah. And, it, and it makes me mad because imagine if I had released You're an like, official third album at that time. Because <laughs> I'm like, that didn't count toward my fucking chart <laughs> positioning. You didn't hate that. But it was really unbelievably hmm. validating. Yeah, you'd gone through that process of basically being an independent now, yeah. right? You are creative directing it. You are basically in the production of it, the writing, the marketing, the promotion, and the release of it, right? How does that shift your mindset and approach towards music moving forward? It definitely uh, put me into a more of an independent spirit, mm. realizing that 
an object in motion or a person in motion stays in motion. So once you take a leap out and you try something, hmm. there will be some type of reward, whether it's people might not like what you put out, it might not be the reception that you were hoping for, but it will have you, there will be some type of forward moving effect. Right, there's always some sort of uh, return in energy. Yes. Right. So I think it really showed me that directly and it made me be like, okay, so if there's nothing that a label can do to stop me from doing this, <laughs> then I'm gonna keep doing things like this yeah. until I figure it out. And then I did really, the bug kind of bit me of, I like having more control over certain hmm. aspects of things. I love collaboration, yeah. but I do like having control of at least how, like, like what color my hair is or whatever, you know? <laughs> because it's you, it's a representation of you, and so now you're in a seat to actually dictate your image in the world versus someone telling you, no, this is what JoJo is in the world. So it was a coming of age huh. professionally and personally, because yeah. around that time, we everyone is, coming of age and thinking they know themselves and thinking they're grown, you know? <laughs> and, then, um, and then you realize that you're still a baby. But it was, it was very much a coming of age of trusting myself, seeing that it was okay, mm -hmm. and learning from that. Learning from that. So take me into to today, right? You're, you're not attached to a label. You actually have your own label, Clover Music. Um, when were you um, inspired and realized that you wanted to really go that route. So after I got out of that first deal, mm -hmm. then I signed right away to another label. Mm. And then I left to go follow that same executive that had signed me there at another thing. Another and then thing. I played executive following <laughs> this one executive. And now I'm at a point where I'm like, I'm not attaching my wagon yeah. to anyone but myself. But yourself. You know, you can, uh, connections are so important. Relationships are everything. But at the end of the day, you've got to really you've got to invest in yourself. So that's- it's you at the end of the day, that's the difference maker. representing yourself at the end of the day. So yeah. my experience, even though I've never been fully independent, my experience with labels have still shown me that you have to be the engine. Hmm. I mean, you have to propel yourself forward. When things are working, that's when a label will step in with budgets. You have to think of a label as like a bank, hmm. you know, and use them for what they have, which is resources, and do all that you can on your own. Uh, so to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I mean, in 2022, there's no room for laziness as, mm. as an artist. You can't just be passive about getting your music out there. Because um, it's so competitive. It's competitive, but when you have a relationship with your listeners, and I'm saying listeners because maybe not everybody has fans yet. Mm. But if someone's listening to your to your music, then that that can grow, that can scale, and that's just what I'm focused on now yeah. is really shedding the layers that I've built up over the years <laughs> of being super defensive, of being afraid, of holding on to things really tightly because I'm just not wanting what has happened in the past to happen happened to again. me again. Yeah. Being shelved, being mm. lied to. Mm. You know, every, everybody's lied to though. I'm not saying like just me, but I'm saying, you know, I just, I'm sensitive to that stuff. Yeah. So now it really is about taking my time, um, continuing to open up with, with my fans on social media mm. and get to know myself. Cause I think that the more we get to know ourselves, the more we can show up and be who we're meant to be mm. in the world, in whatever job we work, <laughs> profession we're in, whatever. That's super powerful because you're right. Like, how can you know even what you're supposed to do here if you're running around trying to be someone else? Trying to be someone else or trying to crack an algorithm code <laughs> or trying to like keep up with the um, release cycle, which mm -hmm. it feels like there's this there's this expectation that artists should release a new album every like three months. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's gotten real aggressive. So I've just unsubscribed <laughs> from that. I'm like, you know what? I, I put out a lot of content in 2020 mm -hmm. and then a pandemic happened, yes. something that we never could have anticipated. Never, right. So now I'm just kind of like, 
what is that next chapter for me? I yeah. want to be super clear on it. Take me into your, your most recent project, which is um, trying not to think about it. All right, there is a lot of maturity that happened um, in that project. And a lot of what you kind of spoke about of some of these unlearnings and these new learnings that you, you brought into there. Um, how were you showing kind of this newer, deeper understanding of yourself? I felt like I will, maybe wouldn't be able to make another album unless I put out something hmm. that just said where I was at at that time. At time. Which I was depressed, I was anxious, I was bitter, resentful of myself, of hmm. others. And I just wanted to put it out into the ether <laughs> and see if anybody else felt that way. Yeah. Because I knew that it wasn't possible that I have a feeling that is just totally unique to me. And, and then it did feel like a warm hug to realize that some other people were struggling with that same thing. But I wanted to, to, to go back to when you asked me about Clover, which is my mm -hmm. label, my imprint. My goals for Clover are much bigger than what I've accomplished yeah, so far. Yeah, tell me about that. I really, really want to be instrumental in other artists' careers mm. because I, I know that I have a lot to offer as far as advice, guidance, whatever an artist would, would want or need. But because of my own experience of being disappointed by, by people who probably meant well, right. I, I am so sensitive to the artist mm -hmm that I just want to make sure that I have the right infrastructure, that I can be fully present and available, you know, for whatever it is an artist needs. And as you think about your label, are you going to lean any sort of way on type of like music and artists you want to sign? I'm drawn to things that have soul in the core. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. I like people who know, who have a unique writing voice, like mm -hmm. who, I think it's important for me that an artist is self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So whether they play an instrument or they engineer their own vocals or they write or co-write with a friend, whatever the case is. Um, but it doesn't really matter the genre. They just have to be dope. I love that you're open to it. And also I'm very curious to see, you know, how Jojo, the, the, the label owner and the EP shows up. Things are changing in the music industry. And I think it's gonna be young women and other mm. people who haven't always been at the forefront that are going to be leading that change. So it's important to me that I can be a part of that. Yeah. I want to see it. As you reflect on what you've been through, right, and also where you're headed, um, when you think about younger JoJo, what advice would you offer younger JoJo um, today about never missing your moment? About never missing your moment? Mm -hmm. It's okay to stay in bed one day, hmm. but really try not to make it two days in a row because then it easily becomes a week of, of staying in a, dip, like get outside, feel the sun on your face, you know, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And I know this, this maybe doesn't sound very encouraging or nice, but whatever, I'm kind of a hard, hard ass sometimes. <laughs> so I would say like, nobody's gonna save you. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna swoop down mm -hmm. and, and offer you a, a silver platter of solutions. You have to figure something out for yourself. Wow. You need to learn how to, parent yourself, how to educate yourself, how to, you just need to, and you need to choose wisely too and mm. watch who you're hanging out with. And that's what I would say to young Jojo. I don't know if she'd listen to me. She'd be like, you're old. <laughs> you're <weird." laughs> so I don't know. But I do believe that what you're listening to, who's around you, what type of things, like all that really matters. So yeah. I, I would encourage her to, to Stay on the straight and narrow. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what I have listened to. No, I, I love it though. Um, Jojo, thank you, thank you so much thank for you. for sharing so much. Um, I've asked you a ton of questions, but now I want to make sure we have our audience has their shot to ask you <laughs> questions because I know they've been dying, and I know that connection that you have with your audience. So um, we we have some fans here. Okay. Can we uh, can we get a mic and and figure out where our first question is coming from? Uh, my name is America. Hi, America. Uh, hi. Um, such a big fan. Um, so I know music is your first love, and you become a blueprint to all these pop girlies nowadays. Oh, thank you. But as someone whose introduction to JoJo was RV and, like, Aquamarine, <laughs> is there a chance we might have to see, like, acting JoJo soon? Mm. Or, mm. So no. many JoJos. <laughs> <laughs> acting JoJo, pop JoJo, RV. Um, yeah, yeah, why not? I... 
I really like acting. I did a little guest spot recently on All American, that show, and that was fun. And, um, and it really made me, reminded me how much I dig it. So, but I wanna play other roles that I'm not being offered right now. So I need to change the perception of myself as an actress. I need to like continue to do these self tapes at home and show the casting directors that they should cast me in the next Boston movie. <laughs> it is what it is. But thanks, America. Thank you so much for your question. Okay, let me see hands. Next question. We're gonna go here in the back. Hi, Jojo, I'm Jess. Hey, Jess. You have been in the music industry for over two decades. What? Damn! Um, <laughs> Whoa! Sorry to date it like that. No, wow. What a legacy you have left. In that time, how have you seen the music industry change for the better and for the worse? And how, what is your best advice for adapting to those changes in the next five years? Mm. Nobody knows what they're doing. We're all just really trying to figure it out, I would say. Like, just on a day-to-day -day tip, like, what is life? What are we doing? But, uh, but I will share my experience with you. So how has it changed? I mean, when I started putting out music in 2004, officially, um, it was, there were less artists because social media was just really starting to pop off. So, you know, you could release your stuff on MySpace and like, that's kind of how I launched. And now there's endless ways of releasing music. Um, major labels used to be m majorly important, but now there's so many different ways you can go about it. You could get, you could go completely independent. You could try to find somebody who will invest in you because you do need money if you want like your music to travel to, to a certain extent. But I do think that TikTok is an amazing equalizer and opportunity to find your people. Yeah. Because if you keep putting stuff out, it's like that old thing, like build it and they will come. I do think that's true. If you're like putting out stuff, it's, people will find it. Even if, my, my friend posted something recently and it said, like you're tripping on just getting 60 likes, but imagine if 60 people came up to you and told you how pretty you are or whatever. Mm -hmm. You'd be overwhelmed, because that's a lot. That's a lot of people. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much for your question. We're gonna take one more, and I think we're gonna go here on the front row. We're no stranger to, obviously, the darkness that you've faced in this industry. Um, there's been so much light, but so much dark with your battle. And I was there with you every step of the way. I think all of us were. I know you have been. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. What is one, one red flag you would give to independent artists hmm. when signing, negotiating, et cetera, with labels, and one green flag that Ooh. you would give artists? I think a red flag is... is uh, a label or the, the, the other side rushing the process, rushing to be like, we, we, we have to close this right now. Take your fucking time when going through the contract. Don't be afraid to negotiate. I think also if, um, make sure that your lawyer and the lawyer at the label don't have like too buddy-buddy over relationship or whatever because that could be a bit of a conflict. And then a green flag I would say is if somebody is willing to let you, um, that after a period of time, you can own your masters again. Mm. That it's not just. Not in perpetuity. That it's not in perpetuity. That they don't just own everything. That you do have a chance even if it's, if it's a decade later or two decades later or something to retain that again. Mm. I think also a good green flag is if they don't try to take absolutely everything. Like you should still be able to sign a publishing deal separately. You should still be able to sign for acting separately, commercial, blah, blah, blah. Don't let them take everything because they really will and maybe they're not good at everything. <laughs> like, use people for what they're good at. Don't use people. Use companies for what they're good at <laughs> and be nice to people. And I think that's it. Thank you so much for your question. <laughs> <laughs> they said. <laughs> <laughs> all right, JoJo fans in the audience, I want y'all to do me a favor. I want y'all to stand up, make some noise for JoJo. She came all this oh, way to share a story with us.